This is the third seminar in our series, the Hong Kong University, Hong Kong Baptist University Seminar on European Politics. So we have brought together the Fos Vive, if you like, of two of our uh, institutions in Hong Kong, uh, HKU uh, and HKBU. Um, and today's topic is a, is, a, is a fascinating one. It's very pertinent uh, and it's absolutely in front of me now. It's the European Union as a community of values, Poland and Europe's rule of law crisis. Okay. Um, my name is Alastair Cole. I'm a, a professor of politics here and I head our Department of Government and International Studies. Um, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about our, my prestigious panel. Uh, and it, it's really great, actually. I'll, I'll introduce you in the order I've got you written down here. That won't necessarily be the order in which you're speaking. So just be, be simple and bear with me. Um, so in a sense, our, our, our external, uh, our, our HKU speaker is Stefan, Stefan Auer. And Stefan Auer is Jean Monnet Chair and Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Stefan is a, a prolific scholar, uh, has written uh, very, very widely, uh, very well-known and well-received book, Liberal Nationalism in Central Europe. Um, he's published in many of the leading uh, political science journals. Um, and, uh, in a, and, uh, and really, I think, what, I think what's interesting with Stefan, with your profile, is how you, in a sense, you, you, you span various different areas, really, of... Uh, of, of what we might broadly call European politics. I mean, you're, you're as interested in political philosophy as you are in nationalism, as you are in, uh, 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 more generally speaking, European politics. You're, you're well networked, you're, you're well mediatized as well. Okay, so that's, so that's great. And it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Slavinsky, Dr. Christoph Slavinsky is, a, is one of our colleagues here. Uh, Chris is a colleague, you've been here for a lot longer than I have, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, Chris has actually been here since 2008. And Chris, you got your PhD from the University of Warsaw, the Institute of International uh, Relations. Um, you, you regularly teach uh, with us on European integration, security studies, international relations, global society. And, and, you know, and again, your, your, your interests are you, you, your, your interests are quite broad. Uh, they, 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 they range across a number of countries, um, but particularly you work in the, in, this, uh, in the area of foreign security policy. Uh, and, uh, but the particular, I suppose, a particular view on um, how we should theorize European integration. And I think that's been one of the themes of your work uh, in recent years. Uh, and, it's, you know, and, and you've been publishing uh, in that particular area and notably on the theme of principled intergovernmentalism uh, the European Review was one of your most recent uh, publications. So it, uh, it, it's great to have you uh, with us. Chris, then moving to my left, um, Nicole, Nicole Skikluna. Skikluna. Okay, Nicole Skikluna. I should know this by now. I, I'm going to get it soon because Nicole is, of course, one of our colleagues now. And um, Nicole's been with us since September, since August, actually, since, since August. And... Uh, Nicole is also a, a prolific scholar. Nicole um, used to work at the University of Birmingham, which is a very good university in the UK, but, but you also did your thesis at La Trobe. Um, and so, uh, and you published very widely. I mean, uh, since you've been here, you've had a book out with OUP, you've, <laughs> you've published a whole series of articles in, in leading journals, well, not with us in Hong Kong Baptist, but nonetheless, since you've been at, in, in recent years, Journal of European Public Policy, Journal of Common Market Studies, European Law Journal, International Journal of Constitutional Law, West European Politics, and, and we go on. The, the, these are suppressive set of journals, um, very much so. And of course, so it's great to have you uh, with us as a colleague, uh, uh, but today you're gonna to be speaking very much to your sort of uh, core expertise really, which is, I suppose the role of law uh, the role of law as, a, as part of a community of values at the European level. And then last but no means least, um, Dionysos, Dionysos Stivas, who uh, has his 
PhD from the very famous government and international relations, uh, government and international studies department of Hong Kong Baptist University. Uh, so well done, uh, well done, Dionysus. Um, uh, of course, I, this is our department. So uh, Dionysus uh, did his PhD in our department uh, a couple of years ago. I think he finished, but it seems a long time ago. Uh, you've been uh, Dionysus has been a uh, a, a steady teacher for us. You've, you, you've taught on a wide, wide variety of courses from the politics of cinema through gender, through ethics of internet, uh, through ethics and public policy, through sustainable cities, and so on. Uh, many, many, many things. Um, it's interesting. I think I think your, your your background also, Dion, because you do have a very much a legal bent. I mean, you were in the uh, you did your master in European law at Maastricht University, and then you went to the, the Collège de Bruges, which, of course, as you know, is, is a very uh, prestigious uh, institution. Uh, and then, of course, you came to the uh, you came to, 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 to HKBU. You were also an intern at the Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg. And so you, you can speak with some authority on, on, on legal issues. Now, um, those presentations over, let's move on to the uh, the, the main theme of the day, the, the title of our seminar, the European Union as a community of values, Poland and Europe's rule of law crisis. I'm the, just the chair here. Um, and we have to be cognizant of the time that's already moving on. So I'm just going to not, not say too much. But I think I'd like to invite each speaker to give a general sort of five or six minute introduction on the theme of a very, very general question, really. What do you understand by the statement that the European Union is a community of values? Is, this, is it a, a convincing, legitimizing narrative? Is it necessary but not sufficient? If not, then what alternative might uh, dis best describe the uh, EU? And I think we'll start uh, with you, Stefan, is that okay? Oh no, Nicole, sorry, excuse me, yeah. Oh, that's right, my, my order's wrong. Nicole, please. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, and so, yes, in what sense is the EU a community of values? Well, I would start by making the point that one of the things that sets the European Union apart from other regional and global intergovernmental organizations is that it does have value-based membership criteria. <coughs> so the first criterion for joining the EU is be a European state be a European state. But then equally, would-be members have to, um, have to respect certain fundamental values, uh, and those being democracy, human rights, minority rights, protections for minorities, and the rule of law. And these are often referred to as the Article 2 values because uh, in the Treaty on European Union, they're uh, written down in Article 2. They're codified in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. So then these two things, being a European country, and professing a commitment to these fundamental values become conflated. They go hand in hand. And so this is an important sense in which the EU is a community of values. And again, it's unlike, say, the United Nations, and it's not like the United Nations has no values attached to it, but um, it's a club of states, right? There's not a kind of qualitative uh, value-based aspect to the membership. It's a club of states. So that does set the European Union apart. And it is a very important legitimizing narrative. It's really important to how the EU constitutes itself as an actor, both internally, so vis-a-vis -vis the member states themselves, and also vis-a-vis -vis European citizens with whom the EU has a direct relationship. Uh, so that's the internal dimension. And it's also important as a legitimizing narrative in the external dimension. So vis-a-vis -vis the world at large, and particularly vis-a-vis would-be member states, potential member states and applicant member states. And a lot is demanded of applicant member states, right? Not least that they adhere to these values. So yes, it's a very important legitimizing narrative. It really uh, is, is core to the EU's identity. So the EU is a guarantor of basic rights as a protector and projector in the world of fundamental values uh, is an essential part of the EU's identity. And it is an important source of legitimacy, especially given uh, the relative weakness of input legitimacy, that is democratic legitimacy at the EU level. But it's not the only source of the EU's legitimacy. So another important one is law. Right? So the EU is very much a community of values, but it's also very much a community of law. 
And in this dispute, the dispute between the EU on the one hand and Poland and, and Hungary as well um, on the other hand, we, we see very much that law and values intersect. Um, and so I would just take a couple of minutes for the rest of my introductory statement to say something about the principle of EU law supremacy. Uh, firstly, because it is fundamental to the EU's identity as a community of law. And secondly, because it's central to this rule of law dispute with Poland. So what is that principle? The principle of EU law supremacy, uh, I'm referring to the principle of the doctrine that if there is a clash between the national law and a European law in an area in which the EU has law making competences, then the EU law prevails. So it's a hierarchical principle. Um, and it is extremely important, right, without this principle, without this ordering principle, the EU as we know it um, couldn't exist and wouldn't exist, right, the single market wouldn't exist. All federations need a rule of this kind, a hierarchical rule, a rule for dealing with conflicts of laws, right? If you have different levels of lawmaking, a regional level, a federal level, so on, you need to have some rule of, of uh, working out which law will prevail if there's a clash. So it's extremely fundamental to the workings of the EU. The EU would not exist without this principle. Um, and, and maybe somewhat counterintuitively considering its importance, and I'm sure many of you already know this, uh, the, the principle of EU legal supremacy is not actually explicitly addressed in the EU's founding treaties. Um, so this is the interesting part. It was never explicitly agreed to by the, the founding member states. So where does it come from? It comes from the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice of the European Union is an extremely important institution. So uh, somewhat like what the Supreme Court of the United States did a long time ago, um, the Court of Justice interpreted the treaties in such a way as it found this principle of supremacy was essential to make the treaties work. Okay, uh, and that's important and it's something we can come back to in our discussion because um, by and large, this doctrine that the court read into the treaties, even though the member states didn't explicitly agree to it in the treaties, they have accepted it and, and the national authorities of the member states have by and large accepted and upheld this doctrine, right? by and large, but not completely, which is where our current dispute comes in. But I will leave my introductory statement there. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Nicole. Um, I'll hand over straight away to Stefan. Thank you. And I would just very much like to expand on what Dr. Sikluna uh, introduced. So the EU indeed is a community of values, uh, but it is not a community of the kind that would constitute a state. And that, I think, is at the heart of the problem. Uh, so Dr. Sikuna was too polite to, to name the elephant in the room, and that is the allegation that Poland has just basically violated the European values, right? That it, it started a kind of rebellion against that principle of supremacy uh, that we were introduced to. And so it might be true that Poland violated European values and even possibly explicit rules, but the problem for the EU is that in order to effectively address this, this violation, the EU itself, I believe, would be forced to violate its own values and its own rules. I, I think this is uh, the essence of the problem that we gathered here uh, 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 to discuss. And so one question is rather technical, and, and uh, we will discuss you know, the decision of the Polish uh, uh, Constitutional Tribunal and whether it's compatible uh, with the EU law. But the question I want to focus on is more political, and that is the question about uh, possible remedies. And here we are talking about penalties and whether the EU institutions themselves are violating rules and imposing these penalties on Poland. So the current situation is that Poland uh, is obliged to pay 1.5 million euro uh, daily uh, penalty for what the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union uh, ascertained as the violation of of EU rules. Now, I, I think that there are two problems there. One is uh, the question of consistency. So particularly that one fine that uh, is directly uh, in, in response to judicial reforms that, that uh, the Polish government has pursued. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, the, the uh, rule of law uh, mechanism is, is, is used. Uh, um, and, and that it appears to be used uh, in a way that targets Poland more uh, 
uh, than other country. Because Poland is not the only country that has problems with judiciary, uh, with corruption, and, and, uh, et cetera. And, and uh, uh, the, the possibly more severe punishment would be to, to withheld uh, the funding, the future generation EU funding, uh, uh, that is on a much bigger scale than, than the current fine. And there, uh, even more, I think that criticism applies. But there is a number of countries where the irregularities with the spending of uh, EU money are way more pronounced. Romania, Bulgaria, uh, even Italy or, or Malta. Uh, the, the problems with corruption uh, affect my homeland, Slovakia, right? Way more uh, than Poland. So there is a question of consistency. But for me, the bigger challenge and the more difficult question that this crisis presents is what the EU is meant to be. And there I want to uh, uh, introduce you to two German uh, terms. It, it is quite interesting that the, co the EU Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, when she gave her uh, um, address to the uh, European Parliament, the State of the Union address, she switched to German when talking about the rule of law crisis. You know, she's fluent in French, she's fluent in English. She switched to German when she talked about the rule of law crisis. And that I think for a good reason, because the rule of law is essential to German self-understanding after the Second World War. Uh, but that helps me also to explain the nature of the problem by just using two key terms. Uh, the term that Dr. Sikuna used, uh, the EU as a, as a community of law, is derived from German Rechtsgemeinschaft, which was introduced by the first president of the European Commission, Dr. Walter Harstein, who himself was a professor of law. And it's an interesting term and an interesting innovation, Rechtsgemeinschaft, as opposed to Rechtsstaat, so the community of law, not Rechtsstaat, which is the German version of the rule of law, but it really means the rule of law state. The problem we have is that the EU is not a state, not a rule of law state. So it is a community of law, not a rule of law state at the European level. The difference being that the state has mechanisms and the source of legitimacy to enforce its laws internally. The EU does not have those. The EU is and remains a voluntary community of law. And that is where the EU is currently in this impossible situation, I believe, because to truly bring uh, Poland into line with the demands that uh, the European Court of Justice, the Commission articulated, the EU would have to become more disciplinary. As my friend Hans Kudnani of Chatham House, London, uh, put it uh, a couple of years ago, it would be the EU that disciplines and punishes. He invoked Foucault, of course, there in that term. And that would be an EU that is quite different from what the founding fathers imagined because that principle of voluntary cooperation would be violated through that. And that is where the problems of the rule of law crisis are linked, intimately linked, entangled with the question of uh, competencies. And the ultimate question, which is a Schmittian question, Karl Schmidt, uh, the German jurist uh, who disgraced himself by being a Nazi, but a brilliant thinker, Karl Schmidt asked the question of who is the final arbiter? Who is the guardian of the constitution? So in the European context, in the EU context, the question is who has the final say? The German Constitution Court decided many years ago that the EU is ultimately a community of uh, member states, a community of nation states, and it is the nation states who are the masters of, of the treaty. Right? And so the EU only has powers that the nation states uh, delegate uh, uh, to it. And, and, and the uh, German Constitutional Court also uh, kept the, 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 the right to decide on what matters to, to uh, German democracy. Uh, I, I think we'll talk about it more. But for me, the, the key question is this. Can the EU effectively address the problem that Poland, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, created? without itself abandoning its core commitment to, to, to a Europe as a community, as a voluntary community of, of values. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank, uh, thanks. thanks very much, uh, uh, Stefan. We'll now move over. Um, Chris. Yeah. Let me begin. Uh, are you, can you come in now? Um, yeah. 
Uh, sure. Thank you, yes. Uh, building on what uh, Stefan and Nicole uh, said uh, before, yes, indeed, the European Union is indeed a community of values. It is, indeed, it is a voluntary uh, organization. The states voluntarily participate there. But when they decide to voluntarily participate to enter the European Union, the European Union doesn't invite states. They ask the European Union to accept them, they also accept uh, the treaties, primary law, they accept the regulations, the directives, and they accept also the rulings of the Court of Justice. Uh, Article 1 and Article 2 of TEU that are challenged by the Constitutional Court of uh, Poland uh, precisely, are, precisely mention things about the values, the European values, and about um, the ever-expanding European Union, the Article 1. Uh, so they are binding to the member states. Now, for our audience, I don't know if you are familiar with what has happened in uh, between Poland and the European Union, just to give you a small uh, outline. The dispute has started not now in 2021. It has started already from 2017. After the governing party in Poland uh, took power, it changed the judges of the Constitutional Court, of the Constitutional Tribunal. It forced the retirement of some judges in order to add judges uh, from the political party, the ruling political party uh, in this tribunal. This, of course, upset the European Commission and the European Union, because it clearly violated Article 2 of TU about rule of law. Uh, rule of law is about the dependence court, clear separation of powers, and uh, the principle of legal certainty. And these were not observed in the opinion of the Commission, of the European Commission by Poland. Uh, so it was not directly the European Court of Justice that uh, took action against uh, Poland. It was the Commission. And after um, five years of discussions, the Court of Justice took over. In July, uh, the Court of Justice asked with its ruling, with the ruling, uh, asked, the, asked Poland to dismantle, to dissolve a disciplinary tribunal that was established by the Constitutional Court. A disciplinary tribunal that could punish judges from lower courts for sending um, uh, references for preliminary ruling under Article 267 of TFU to the European Union for interpretation of uh, European law. Upset by this decision, the Prime Minister requested the Constitutional Tribunal to interpret Articles 1, 2 and 19 of the Treaty of the European Union. Actually, the real issue uh, for the Prime Minister to ask the Constitutional tri Tribunal to interpret these articles was the suspension, the request of the CGA to, of the Court of Justice of the European Union to suspend the disciplinary chamber for judges. Now, the Constitutional Tribunal, uh, a month ago, almost a month, one and a half month ago, the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland um, found that the Court of Justice and the European Union have given to themselves competencies. They have misinterpreted Article 1 and Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union to give more competencies to themselves. And this violates, according to them, Polish constitution and Polish sovereignty. Um, they also found that uh, by allowing the lower courts to disapply the constitution, the Polish constitution, and examine the procedure for judges' appointment, this uh, also violated the Polish constitution and was outside of the competencies of the European uh, Union. Now, I hope later in our discussion that I will be able to, uh, to challenge these claims from the Constitutional Tribunal of uh, Poland. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Dr. Stivas. I'm now going to uh, hand over to you, uh, Chris. Thank you very much. So uh, I actually requested to be the last one. Uh, my comments are going to be less uh, uh, regarding 
I'll say legal arguments, more of, uh, I suppose, political, just like Professor Awis, uh, and maybe philosophical uh, uh, as well. Um, and so uh, also, I wanted to be the last one because I uh, think that for the sake of the discussion, it would be good to uh, have a better understanding of the Polish side. Where are some of the experts, commentators, or indeed policy makers in my country, where are they coming from? So I uh, took, uh, uh, I decided to take the, you know, the devil's advocate role for, for today's uh, meeting. Um, uh, yes, so community of values. Uh, I believe you can make an argument uh, that uh, um, among those values, at least one of the principles is unity in diversity, if we're talking about European uh, integration in general and European Union as an institution. And I think that's where a lot of arguments that are contra European Commission or contra Court of Justice of the European Union, contra European Parliament uh, from Poland, that's where they're coming from. This is supposed to be uh, unity in diversity. There is supposed to be room for di diverse institutional um, uh, 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 different, you know, perhaps even different understanding, different applicability of, of, of the same values. So that's, that's to start. Now, you got to understand uh, that um, uh, historical context, I know we Polish like to, to talk about history, but it is very important uh, in, in, our, in, in our history still lives through politics in Poland. And the historical context uh, is very unique and indeed tragic in, in case of my country. Um, uh, just uh, after the Second World War, uh, the Polish people were uh, indeed very much under the control from Soviet Union, um, another federation uh, of sorts. And uh, uh, that wasn't a good experience. That wasn't a good experience. Then uh, just a couple of years after regaining uh, independence, uh, decided to join uh, the European Union. And most importantly, this was a different institution back then. This is a very important argument that I think a lot of uh, commentators, especially in Western Europe, tend to forget. When uh, not only Poland, by the way, uh, also all the other countries from Central Eastern Europe decided to apply for the, uh, um, for the membership that was, uh, you know, early 90s. Uh, became associate in 94, uh, it was a very different institution. And uh, I remember distinctly when uh, uh, politicians, uh, you know, all over, our politicians as well as uh, political leaders from Western countries uh, um, uh, promised that, you know, European Union as an institution would never dare to interfere in internal matters such as judicial system, by the way. Uh, such as moral issues. Oh no, that's always um, your own internal uh, matters. Uh, European Union would, would never um, tell you how to, how to think, what to think on those matters. Um, uh, you know, fast forward today, it's a very different institution. It's a very different institution. And you got to remember that for, for Polish people, uh, our traditions, it's a Catholic country. There's no question about that. Um, uh, which is very traditional, which is very conservative, which you might make an argument that it's actually incompatible with, with, with many um, values of some of the Western European countries. Uh, fine, uh, but that's, that's where we are, that's what it is. And uh, 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 the big uh, question, of course, is that um, uh, I, I suppose one of the reasons why uh, Poland is also now uh, heavily criticized is that um, apart from being conservative, Polish people are nationalistic. You, you got to remember that throughout our history, Polish nationalism, which was very defensive, uh, helped us survive against uh, our contemporary partners in the European Union. We simply see those things very differently, and our history has taught us to look at those things very differently. Um, now, uh, 
another thing about the governing coalition that uh, some of you might not know. Um, most people think that uh, it's just one party, law and justice, and this is a, a very conservative and maybe even right-wing party. Well, nothing further from the truth. Uh, first of all, it's a, a coalition of, of initially three parties, now two parties, so it's a law and justice, but also united Poland. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, at its core, the law and justice, which has majority uh, in the government, is actually very pro-European. They go along with all the major decisions that are made in Brussels. Let me just uh, give you two most important examples. Fit for 55, completely adopted, no problem. Um, recovery plan for Europe that allows to uh, you, European Commission to borrow money in international markets, but also collect its own taxes, which by the way, by the constitution of Poland is against the law. It's good, it would be good to know that. Um, in fact, when we're talking about the judicial system and judicial reforms, you have to remember one more thing. Polish judicial system was never reformed. It was never illustrated. It is, I'm not afraid to say so, corrupted. Um, uh, a lot of uh, judges in Poland uh, officially engage in politics, which is against the law. Uh, they even break laws. They commit petty crimes. If you follow uh, Polish media, they're, they're full of, of stories like that. It's actually embarrassing. And so um, the thing is that uh, within society, our judicial system has rather a very, very low level of trust. We're talking about trust, very low level of trust. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the examples of, of, of the problem was uh, a, a huge reprivatization fraud in the capital city, in Warsaw, where judges basically uh, <clears throat> made decisions against the law, uh, allowing uh, some, of, some, of the, some of the buildings to, to change its ownership. Uh, but it was absolutely uh, ridiculous and, and absolutely against the law. Um, and, and so uh, this is why the uh, uh, part, well, some of the politicians within governments, mostly Zbigniew Ziobro, who's from United Poland, uh, they came up with the idea of this um, <clears throat> disciplinary chamber, because there's no way that you can actually uh, discipline those judges or make sure that they will not break law. It's such you know ridiculous and 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 um, unacceptable way. If we're talking about the rule of law, then this is in fact the argument that they were after. We need to. There was no illustration, but we need to be able to make sure that the judges actually follow the law. What do you do if the judges don't follow the law themselves, if they break the law themselves? You just live it? Uh, <clears throat> so that was the major argument. Now, one of the last things. Uh, so, yes, the Constitutional Tribunal, uh, uh, as uh, Dionysus mentioned this, on the 7th of October, 2021, opined that when there is a collision of legal norms, such as the EU law and the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, versus Polish constitution, it is the Polish constitution that prevails. This stems from the article 90 of the Polish constitution and the constitutional tribunal could not say otherwise. If it is to observe the constitution, it simply could not say otherwise. And by the way, it was not the first time that the constitutional tribunal said something like that because there were previous opinions that follow exactly the same logics. But importantly, it is not about the entirety of EU law, okay? Uh, this decision of the Constitutional Tribunal refers only to those matters that are not delegated, or those issues that are not delegated to the European Commission. All those issues that are delegated to the European Commission, there's no question about that. Yes, EU law is, prevails. But in those areas where there is no delegation, Constitution states, Article 90, that the Polish law prevails. And that's according to our Constitution. So the Constitutional Tribunal, as I say, could not say otherwise. Now, finally, uh, I do agree with uh, Professor Howard that it's, uh, the big question is what is EU to be? And the, 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 the voluntary aspect of it is very, very important. Thank you.
Okay, thanks. Uh, we, we've had a, so those were our initial statements and they were indeed very interesting initial statements and they raised many, many questions. I have a, a number myself, but I, I won't abuse my position as chair actually. Um, what I think I'll try and do, we, we need clearly to both allow the panel to express themselves, but also the audience, because I think that I can feel there are a few questions already. So what I suggest is after those first initial statements, I wonder if there are any really pressing issues or demands for participation from members of the audience. Um, and, and if there are, we'll take them. And then we'll move on and have a second series of questions. But first of all, uh, are there any questions that people would like to ask, ask from the audience or, or comments? Uh, there, were, it was, there were rich presentations. Um, uh, Emily. Thank you very much to all the panelists for these uh, comments. I have a um, question regarding how to link what is happening in Poland with Brexit and whether we are seeing a trend and uh, where do you see this trend going? So I haven't heard the word Brexit uh, in uh, your comments. So do you think that it's related or not? And to what extent there are other also influences uh, from China? Uh, what is Poland's position with China? So um, I want your take on these two um, on these two issues. Thank you. Okay, let, 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 we can have a brief response to that question, and then then we'll come back to that question. Uh, so I think this one's working out. This one. I think the question is excellent. But when when Brexit occurred. A number of politicians, including Donald Tusk, who was then the president of the European Council and the former Polish prime minister, said that this is not just a British problem, this is a European problem because the problems that the British public uh, responded to that galvanized uh, the support for Brexit are, are spread uh, across Europe. So I very much think that that is uh, uh, spot on. And for me, the main challenge is that the EU appears to be on that uh, path towards an ever closer union. I would slightly disagree with uh, Chris's uh, statement that when, when Poland joined, the EU was something completely different. It wasn't quite completely different for Britain. That was a much bigger uh, difference between 1973 and, and then 2017. But it is still true that the EU that we have today is quite different from what it was 2004. And I think there is a disconnect between EU elites and, and political elites in major capitals, particularly in Berlin, that continue pushing towards an ever closer union and general public, including in France, that no longer wants that federalizing uh, project. So it is interesting in this context that the coalition government in Germany just published its agreement that explicitly states that uh, the new German government will be working towards a quasi Federation empowering uh, the EU institutions. And that is not compatible with what uh, the Polish government and strongly supported by the Polish people want. So there is a genuine challenge about what the EU is meant to be. And I think Brexit uh, presented that with an urgency. And now Poland uh, uh, kind of restates that challenge to my, to my mind. Thanks. I, I think that's a great response uh, to a very fine question. I, I might actually. Um, build on that response to ask a se second series of questions and then we'll have another intervention from the uh, from the floor if we may i mean i think it is interesting actually if we think about um poland and more generally the countries of central and eastern europe i mean you know when, when the cop these countries try first you know announced their will to join the eu but the early 1990s i think the copenhagen criteria they were 1993 weren't they and so it was and it took until 2004 to actually get into the eu so it was a long process of europeanization before being a member of the eu and i suppose you might argue uh that i mean it was it was a, a very thoroughgoing process of europeanization in many respects but you know I, and i suppose this is to come back to your point chris because i do agree actually with stefan in a way that there was a process of uh you know i mean it, it it, clearly some of the key decisions had already been taken i mean there's a, maybe a bit of path dependency about this as well you know the key decisions over the single european act the key decisions in maastricht you know the, these are these are absolutely particularly maastricht 
absolutely get game changers. And so to some extent, they, they determined the path that is actually very difficult for countries not to, uh, to and, and, uh, and I suppose this, my question really, is a, it's a classic question about Europeanization, you know, not, not a definitional one, because that can be extremely tedious to get into definitions of Europeanization. Um, however, uh, but, 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 but there is, in a sense, you know, there was one article of that massive literature on Europeanization that was called quite simply, has Europeanization gone too far? And I think in a way, um, I think in the, in the case of, Pung, uh, well, that, that's a question really. Uh, does the Polish case demonstrate, uh, I mean, what does it demonstrate really? Does it demonstrate that the European, that the European projects in a sense only works in so far as it can be legitimately interpreted domestically in relation to those key domestic traditions as in Poland, for example, or, or, or should that not actually matter? Is if we're defining the EU project as a, as a form of legal convergence, then should it actually matter what the individual uh, countries, traditions and so on uh, think? So that, that's my, my question. Um, and it's one that's meant to sort of, uh, create some disagreement. But I'll maybe hand over to you first, Dionysus. You, you have a line on that. One. Repeat. Oh, sorry. Yeah. One, one, one uh, sentence. One sentence. Okay, very, very, yeah. Um, should, uh, in a sense, if you're, uh, if you're in the European Union, do you play by the rules of that European Union game, almost irrespective of your, of your national context? Yes, or and I will try to answer with another question. What should the European Union do when a member state clearly violates the rules that's supposed to respect when it joined the European Union? So you have a country that joins the European Union, promises to respect rule of law, accepts the treaties, uh, the courts of the, the rulings of the courts of justice and then starts to disrespect these uh, rules uh, starts to appoint the judges according to being friends of the legislative and the uh, executive what should they do do in this uh, case they should react somehow and the reaction is offered uh, the reaction of the european union is written in article 7 of the European Union. Article 7 is linked with Article 2. So countries that clearly violate the fundamental values of the European Union, also the rule of law, can be found uh, guilty, can be found liable for doing so, first by the Council uh, in four-fifths majority, majority Article 7, Paragraph 1, then under Article 7, Paragraph 2, the European Council in unanimity could uh, determine a serious violation of the treaties enshrined in uh, Article 2, and then uh, some um, punishment could result from the European uh, Union. This hasn't happened in the case of Poland yet because, the, uh, because of the unanimity requirement under Article 7, Paragraph 2, and uh, Hungary sides with uh, Poland and doesn't allow the European uh, Council to move forward with uh, applying sanctions to uh, Poland. Uh, yeah, so clear violation of values should be punished by the European Union. There should be a mechanism to punish countries that violate uh, the values of the European Union. Okay, thanks. Uh, th thanks, Jonas. Let, 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 let me bring in Nicole and then, and then, and then, uh, and then Chris. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of has Europeanization gone too far? Um, in a way, it's gone too far and not far enough. Um, it's, it has gone far enough that it would be extremely difficult to undo. Um, it's gone far enough that decisions made by individual member states uh, seriously and greatly affect the union as a whole and affect other member states. It's not gone so far as to create, in a political sense, a European federation, a European state. Right? In, 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 in some ways, legally, it looks like a federation, but not politically. So the member states do remain sovereign. And this kind of in-between, in-the-making, unsettled, sui generis status 
uh, has certain, certain advantages, but it brings its own challenges. So is the EU unduly interfering in Poland? Um, it's, it is really difficult to answer because I agree with what some of Chris said. So it must be possible to undertake judicial reform. Okay, it must be possible for a member state to undertake judicial reform, but there must also be limits to that. Interestingly, the EU doesn't have, so yes, the EU only has the powers that are conferred on it, right? Any power that's not conferred on the European Union remains with the member states. And of course, the devil is in the details, right? So where is that line? That's where all the, the conflict is. Um, the EU doesn't have direct competences over judicial reform. So um, the Court of Justice jurisprudence on this hangs largely on Article 19, which basically, you know, I won't get too much into legal technicalities, but basically, in order for the whole thing to work, member states have to uh, apply EU law in good faith, right? And they have to sincerely cooperate. And so member states must have um, remedies, must be able, member states must be able to give effect to EU law. And this is what the Court of Justice hangs its jurisprudence on, right? So from that, um, the Court of Justice is kind of getting to the idea that if um, the independence of the judiciary has been so undermined, right, then it can be said that that country can no longer uphold EU law. Therefore, it doesn't meet its Article 19 obligation. So you understand what I'm saying? There's not a direct provision saying, you know, if judicial independence is undermined, the EU can act. Uh, it doesn't have those kind of tools directly. Maybe it should have. It doesn't. So it goes through this kind of obligation for the member states to have effective remedies to uphold EU law. And it says, well, you can't do that if the courts aren't impartial. You can't do that if there's no independent judiciary. And that's what they're going through. So is the EU unduly interfering? Well, this is where I agree with um, Dion that it, the EU can't not respond to what it perceives as democratic backsliding. It certainly can't not respond to willful non-compliance with EU law, because if it's not a community of values and it's not a community of law, then what's left? So yes, but this creates all sorts of problems. The EU has some tools in its toolkits like Article 7, it struggles to use them. So then what we see basically that the limits of the EU as this in between in the making uh, entity are very much exposed. I mean, it's genuinely, genuinely a dilemma. I think the EU has to respond and have to, has to react but it doesn't have the kind of direct oversight tools it might like. Um, and, you know, the tools it does have, Article 7, is basically for political reasons, because of the need for basically, in the end, unanimous support other than the affected country. It's just, you know, it just can't use Article 7. Um, and it, it doesn't have kind of, and, and so if I can just make one final comment to bring in Emily's point about Brexit, yes, the, the broader trend is this contestation over the limits, right, of the limits of EU competences. But the big difference is that, you know, Britain left, the UK left, and Poland doesn't want to leave, has no intention of leaving. And in some ways, that's a worse problem because one of the tools that the EU does not have, and I'm not saying it would be good to have that tool because that would be problematic in its own ways, but a member state can't be expelled. So, you know, it's a problem within. Um, and, you know, at least, I mean, Brexit was difficult and painful, but at least they left. Okay, thanks. Uh, that gives food for thought. Um, Chris. Okay, briefly, as, uh, as the time is pressing, I suppose, very good question, and, it, and it, uh, I think it resonates with uh, what uh, Stefan said about, you know, what is EU to be? And the answer to this, to this question, I suppose, pretty much uh, depends whether you, you're a skeptic or you're an enthusiast. Obviously, for your enthusiasts, for federalists, it's not enough. Much more should be achieved. Uh, if you're a skeptic, uh, intergovernmentalist, uh, then obviously it's, it's way too much and, uh, and too fast. Um, going back to, uh, to what's, what, uh, what was said before uh, regarding, you know, what kind of institution where countries from Central and Eastern Europe are joining and what it has become. Uh, yes, the, 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 the general direction of travel, I think, was there and you could, you could, um, you could, uh, you could foresee that to an extent, uh, but there's a number of elements that uh, no one could foresee, and uh, I think I'm, I'm specifically referring here to moral progressiveness of uh, Western political elites that are simply completely incompatible with the values of many societies in Central Eastern Europe. 
and uh, I don't think they will ever be accepted in countries like Poland. Um, will it cause uh, polexit? Uh, there's a lot of talking about polexit, but mostly inside Poland. And it's uh, the way I understand it, purely a political game between the government and the opposition. The opposition is simply using this to press the government uh, to go along with, uh, you know, whatever Brussels says, basically. Uh, yeah, that would be my answer. I, I want to, uh, uh, I want to put things into perspective and want to say a, a few things about the enlargement. So I, I want to start uh, by saying that Europeanization did go too far. And already before the countries uh, uh, were uh, uh, enabled, allowed to, to join. Uh, and, and then I want to say something about the relationship between the rule of law and democracy. Because what I find problematic in the current debate is that the, the law and the independence of judiciary and all that, they are fetishized, right? Mm. Uh, it's not, the rule of law for me is still not more important than democracy. I learned to appreciate the rule of law. Like we have rule of law still some here in Hong Kong. It's a fantastic thing to have. No democracy, right? Uh, I, I think it's not controversial to say that, right? It, it, it's true. And even the rule of law is being eroded. But when I look at countries like Poland, what we shouldn't forget is that Poland remains an amazing success story of democratization. And so your question made me think of a term that was used and applied across Central and Eastern Europe after 1989. Uh, some people said that what you have seen there was Potemkin's democratization, not real democratization, right? That these are still post-revolutionary uh, societies and they haven't quite managed that. I think that's not true. When you look at these countries, they have achieved a lot in terms of uh, creating vibrant, stable and, and prosperous democracies. So there wasn't Potemkin's democratization, but there was Potemkin's Europeanization. And, and the starting point was problematic, right? And not conducive to the development and, uh, of a thriving rule of law state uh, that these countries try to uh, create. Because what was the first step with the Copenhagen criteria? That uh, all the uh, new member states had to absorb 80,000 pages of EU legislation. That, that is not a very, very uh, uh, kind of healthy political development when you are creating uh, uh, the rule of law state, right? So there is a tension between the rule of law and, and democracy. And I think that tension uh, needs to be uh, acknowledged. And that is where I, I side with uh, Chris and a number of points uh, you made, like judicial reforms, all governments in Poland of all political persuasions agreed that they were necessary. The judiciary became a kind of protected uh, caste, a, a species uh, on its own. And this is not a comment that the current government uh, makes, they do that too, or, or Chris, uh, but, but representatives of, of uh, previous governments or, or judges who are profoundly critical of the current government. So you, even though it's 32 years after the collapse of communism, this is still a post-revolutionary situation and the, the disciplinary chamber, for example, exists in Germany and all uh, uh, well-ruled uh, countries because you need to have an instrument uh, to discipline judges. Chris said that there are many who committed uh, petty crimes. There are some who committed serious crimes and it was uh, very difficult uh, to discipline them. But I, I just wanted to, to kind of zoom out and, and, and remind uh, uh, the people of the fact that what has been achieved in, in, in these countries is quite remarkable. So I don't want to ignore the problems. There is a very genuine attempt of the current government to, to, uh, to control the judiciary, to subjugate the judiciary. But the current government also has responded to a very real problem that existed prior to them uh, taking power in, in, in 2015. And the current government also responds to a very real desire of the Polish people to, to contain the ambition of the European project. One more thing, and that is the end of my intervention now. Uh, it's not like the Polish government has no public support. The, 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 and that is where a democratic uh, aspect is relevant, right? Since 2015, uh, people in Poland had, I think, five opportunities to vote in local, national, European elections, and each time, and presidential elections, and each time uh, the uh, Law and Justice Party uh, uh, proved to be the uh, most popular party and managed to uh, uh, combine the coalition to, to sustain uh, the government. So 
that needs to be taken into consideration. For me, democracy uh, uh, still matters, and the EU at a supranational level has less credibility uh, uh, in terms of its own democratic deficit to push forward agendas that simply have no popular support, not just in Poland, but in France, in Italy, uh, and a number of, of countries uh, uh, that where people feel uneasy about the EU the way uh, that people voting in Brexit against the EU membership felt. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that round. Uh, I think we, we, we've had a, a good intervention from our four panelists. Uh, let's, let's go to the floor now. Uh, there's one final question I want to ask, but I won't do it straight away. Are there any points, any pressing questions that we have for our panelists, or indeed comments, can be a comment rather than a question? Um, if there are any, uh, that would be great. If not, then we can move, we can move on. But I mean, in a, in a, yeah, please, yeah. Absolutely. Let me bring this to you. Yes. So I have a question about, um, I think one day Balkan states will become members of the European Union. Um, and we know that uh, those, there's many European states that are um, very corrupt, you said it. Um, and I think we need more federalism to, I'm the one that thinks that we need more federalism to fight uh, corruption, to uh, improve the rule of law in the European Union. Um, and uh, there's new institutions that are being created. I'm thinking, for instance, about the European Public Prosecutor's Office that tries to fight against uh, some corruption issues in some countries but they are obviously not enough. Um, what can be done? What do you think, what I'm asking to all five of you, what institutions, what reforms could be enacted to improve the rule of law in the European Union and at the same time improve democracy in European institutions? I think that's why many people are kind of um, scared by some European reforms. So that's my question. Okay, thanks. That's a, that's a very good question. Let, let's start off with you, uh, Dionis. So, what kind of new institutions could be made? It's not very easy. It's on. Huh? Yes, it is not very easy to create new institutions. It is not very easy even to change one word from the treaties. It requires unanimity. It's not easy to change Article 2, for example. That will be an easy solution in the current situation. European Union changed Article 2. Poland is happy. Everybody is happy. We go on. Uh, not easy. Um, an effective mechanism will be debatable, of course, to have an ex expelling mechanism, expelling article, an article that would make the European Union uh, expel a country that is corrupted or appoints judges uh, of its liking, the government appoints judges of its liking and disrespect the separation of powers and the rule of law. Uh, but it is very difficult for this uh, to happen. It's very technical. They, the treaties, they do not change very uh, easily. Um, what was your second question? To improve uh, the pro democracy in the, of the institutions. Yes, the main problematic institution in terms of democracy, as we all know, is the commission because they are not elected. Then the second one is the Court of Justice and judicial activism, what the European Court of Justice is uh, um, accused of doing now. It is not well perceived by the member states. Now, how can you make this more democratic? Can you make the judges be elected by the people? That could be a mechanism, but I don't think it is viable or the commissioners also to be elected by the European people. That could also uh, be very difficult to, to happen. It is a long discussion and it takes, I think, uh, many months of deliberation between many people, legal scholars, political scholars, to, 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 to find a solution on, in these uh, questions. I cannot give you a direct question. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, so yeah, my starting point would also be that in theory, um, 
so much, you know, if it was possible to reform the EU treaties, then a lot of problems could be fixed. An opportunity could be taken to fix a lot of problems. But then I have to agree that it, it's almost impossible. So the EU treaties haven't been substantially reformed since the Lisbon Treaty. And that was such a long and painful process because it starts with the attempt to adopt a constitution for Europe. That failed. It was repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty. Even that was defeated in a referendum in Ireland. You know, so you're talking about a 10 year long process. So there's an extreme reluctance to go there again, even though it would be needed. As I said, so, you know, the, this uh, Court of Justice has to hang its jurisprudence on Article 19 and the obligation of member states to provide effective remedies. It would be better if there were articles that dealt directly with independence of the judiciary, right? But there's not. Um, so this is, this is the biggest problem. Now, um, in terms of improving the quality of democracy in the member states, so it is largely a political will problem, right? To get agreement amongst the existing 27 uh, on these kinds of reforms. And realistically, it's not just Poland or Hungary or not just Central European countries that would not want to give the supranational institutions more oversight over their internal democratic processes. Um, I, I kind of doubt whether really any member states would be in favour of that. Um, the fact is, a lot of issues are internal affairs and remain internal affairs. You know, I, I mean, Spain doesn't want the EU commenting on what it does with respect to Catalonia, right? And the EU doesn't. The EU stays out of that. It's a Spain issue. Um, so there's just not going to be the political will uh, for reforms to give the EU greater oversight over internal democratic matters. And it's an issue. And then so when it comes to the Balkans, and you mentioned Balkan accession, um, this is complicated. And so, yes, on the one hand, the EU struggles because how can it credibly require quite extensive reforms of the Balkan countries if it can't get its house in order in Poland and Hungary? Um, also, the Balkan countries are being strung along to a large degree. And so now there's, you know, you've got certain arguments militating in favour of moving on with the accession process, security issues, also the fact that promises were made and they're being strung along. I mean, North Macedonia changed the name of its country, you know, and, and, and they're still being strung along. So there are a lot of arguments militating in favour of moving that along. But then also, you know, there is a perception of kind of um, enlargement fatigue, you know, that there are so many internal problems that have to be dealt with before the EU can enlarge. So in a way, then the Balkan states um, and that whole accession process is somewhat of a hostage to all of these other internal dramas. And, and yeah, there is no kind of easy resolution. Uh, thanks for the great question. I'll, yeah. I actually think that that is, that is the question, really. And, and I think that there is an inclination uh, by many of my colleagues, and, and you uh, articulated also, to seek solution in Europe. But there is no solution in Europe. That is exactly what was said. They just are too afraid to say it with such clarity. I say it. Europe will not solve Poland's problems, Macedonia's problems, or Bulgaria's problems. The absurdity of, of this um, fight with Poland is that uh, there are countries in the EU uh, that have experienced uh, state capture, like Romania or Bulgaria, that they are not thriving democracies. But because they play their game more carefully in Brussels and always present themselves as good Europeans, they were never confronted with uh, these uh, kind of penalties, uh, etc. So the EU is not consistent. And that is where it violates its own rules, right? And, and to expect the EU that with all the good things it does, it is not a democratic institution in its own right, right? It is not democratically constructed. It does not have enough democratic uh, legitimacy. Uh, to expect of the EU to fix democracies at national level, it's, it's, it's a fallacy, I think a dangerous fallacy. These democracies can only be uh, sorted out from within. The EU can help, uh, but, but it needs to come from within. Okay, I'll just make a point and then hand on to you. I think it's also fair to say that, I mean, there is a complicated debate between institutions and, and uh, matters such as corruption, you know. Uh, federalism, you could, you could, I mean, at one level, it's a form of institutional design. Does, it, does an institutional design per se necessarily uh, affect or impact upon a societal uh, phenomenon? It might, it might do, but the temptation might just be to create institutions. And actually demonstrating the linkage between creating the institution and solving the problem is, 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 is easy in theory, but in practice it's extremely difficult. But the point I really wanted to make is that democracy in Europe, I mean, to some extent, 
democracy in Europe has to be a multi-level game, you know. I mean, there are clearly multiple levels of identification with, uh, with, with, with politics, with, uh, with community, uh, uh, and, the, and these are very variable across states. I mean, we, we've talked about Catalonia before, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent example in a way. Um, and, and so clearly there's an asymmetrical form of identification with different levels of locality and region across Europe. There are different state traditions. The, the tradition of the Republic in France, for example, is a very strong tradition for democracy in the French context, but in some other contexts, it would be considered to be um, to go against preservation of a certain number of minority rights and so on. So in a sense, there are different um, readings or different interpretations or even different framings, if you like, of democracy within the European context. So I think it's perfectly legitimate to say at the same time, Europe is a space it has to be, and this is where I agree with Dionysus, I mean, it has to be a space for, for, for democracy, how we define that, as well as being a space for law. And those have to be the key values. But I think within the European context, there always have been and probably always will be uh, different varieties of democracy, as there are varieties of capitalism, to use that old, uh, you know, that, 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 that old book. So I, th I, I think we have to be, um, you know, I, and I, I'm not going to go down the, the, the you know, is the Polish exception exceptional? Because that, that would be a good question. I've got it marked down here, but I, I won't perhaps necessarily ask that question. But I think there, are, there, there always will be, and it's, it's healthy for a society, for a federation even, it's healthy to have a, a, a continual calling into question of, uh, of, of the nature of the, of the rules and the institutions, I think. Yeah, that would be my view. Um, <clears throat> thanks a lot. Thanks for a uh, very good question, I think. Um, very briefly speaking again, uh, short of federation, uh, you'll always have a situation where uh, the laws are applicable on, on the national level. Um, uh, and I think uh, Stefan is very right. And there's, there's an inherent tension between uh, journey towards a full federation and democracy. Uh, because democracy, the way it's been practiced uh, especially after the Second World War, has been based on a national level, not supranational level. Uh, experience with democracy has much to do with nation states rather than supranational institutions. Um, so, uh, I, I, and, and, and another point I, I think I want to make is that uh, if you look at contemporary democracies, by the way, yeah, there's there's no doubt, by the way, and I, and I actually, I cannot but notice that there is some sort of a crisis of uh, democracy in, in my country, not only in my country, in Hungary, in other countries. I would even go further and say there's a crisis of democracy in most members of the European Union today, um, for at least three reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, which Brad Evans calls uh, uh, puritanical tribalism, sense of communities lost. Uh, certain depoliticization um, uh, with uh, the discourse narrative being absolutely monopolized by one type of political parties. And, uh, and the third one, which ties up with, with one of the questions that you asked uh, about uh, uh, European, um, what was it, European, Europe Europeanization. Uh, something that I call Europeanism as an ideology uh, that, uh, the way I see it at least, prevails uh, among political elites today in, 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 West, in, in Europe, in European Union. Thank you. Okay, okay th th thanks colleagues. We're, time's pushing on, but we still have time for some questions. And I'm, we've got one from Jamie in here, so let me bring this to you. Thank you. I have a um, question to all of you, uh, which is about the future direction of uh, EU. Do you think it is in the, uh, I mean, further political integration is inevitable if e, uh, EU were to, EU were to be like a major global player along with the US and China? In other words, do you think the loose connection is sufficient I mean, without having like a common army or like a common foreign policy towards uh, China or the US, do you think that is still possible? Like, 
maintaining this loose connection yet being a major global player. Because as you uh, mentioned, there is built in tension between respecting you know, sovereign nation state, but at the same time, EU wanting to be a major player. So yeah, that's my question. Okay, that, 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 that's, a, that's a great question again. Uh, we, we, only, we only ask the big questions here, no, no, not the little questions. Um, I have my own viewers on this, but, let, but uh, I, don't, I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So let, let's give everybody a sort of last, a, a, a good, good attempt to, to, to answer that question. Yeah, excellent question. And, and there seems to be a, a kind of necessity for Europe uh, to, to play a global role. I, I think we really have quite the opposite. There is a great level of integration, there is common currency, etc. great level of integration of uh, uh, the market, but very little uh, where, uh, as you say, it, it, it matters. There, I think, we see the opposite, that major powers like Germany, uh, Germany could do things in the world without the EU, a country of 100 million, one of the richest countries on earth. A country like Germany hides behind the EU. So it pretends it's impotent because uh, the EU needs to agree and the EU never agrees, right? It pretends it can't do things, right? So it, it really is, it, the question is spot on. There is no good answer. I would just say that what the EU we right now have is quite the opposite of what we should have. There should be more unity in areas that really matter globally and perhaps more diversity in areas uh, that, that don't matter. Like, like Poles will need to work out what kind of judicial system they want, right? Uh, uh, but the Europeans have interests to defend globally. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I also think that was an excellent question. And uh, uh, geopolitical, I suppose. Um, um, and I, my take on this is, um, I have to say I'm quite skeptical of uh, EU playing uh, a role of a you know, global player or, or global power. Um, but again, uh, if, if uh, and, and that's actually one of the major arguments of federalists. I mean, listen to Guy Verhofstadt, right? Practically every time he says EU uh, has to become a federation because only then we'll be able to stand up to China. Only then we'll be able to stand up to United States. Uh, politically, of, of course, right? Um, maybe, maybe. Uh, but I think it's highly unlikely, to be honest, uh, for, an, for a number of reasons, uh, some of them that I just mentioned, and a number of others. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I'd say I'm highly skeptical. I'll abuse my position as chair, just uh, briefly, if I may. I think it's a great question, actually. And it, and it does, it, it brings forward reflection on the, uh, again, the, the sort of asymmetric nature of competencies in Europe and, and, and possibilities or capabilities, if you like. And it's true that, you know, uh, if we take defence, you know, defence is, is a classic one. I mean, clearly there are, there is a Euro, objectively speaking, there ought to be, in a sense, a European defence interest. But it is also very clear that Europe, the different European countries have uh, rather different framings on should there be a European defence. And, and just take the classic Franco-German um, couple, if you like. It's clear, and I agree actually with, with Stefan here, that it's clear that in some important respects, Germany has not perhaps felt uh, able or certainly willing to, to take on some of those responsibilities that you might assume a, a country of that importance uh, would do. The French case is clearly very different. France has traditionally uh, had a a much stronger, if you like, defence sector, and, and argued more for European security along the sort of French lines. But then again, there's ambivalence in relation to the role of NATO again, and um, and these questions haven't gone away. They're, they're very important questions, particularly at the moment. And I think the the instability in the front and you know on the borders, the instability between Russia and Ukraine in particular, can raise some massive, almost existential questions for. For, for Europe, and those questions are the really big, important ones that need to be addressed. Um, so, uh, so uh, it's a great question. I, I agree that there's a very high degree of integration in terms of single market. There's a, even if not everybody's part of the euro, it's still a high degree of integration. Uh, the, the, the euro might collapse one day, but it's, it's no, 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 not yet anyway, not, not for a very long time, I don't think. But yet in other areas, um, you know, the, 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 there's not quite so much uh, 
possibility. We could talk about this all night, but we're not going to because I'm going to hand over now to Nicole. Um, well, yeah, I can I can respond really briefly that basically, yeah, so the EU's capacity to act on the world stage is seriously constrained by the common foreign and security policy that does require unanimity. It is a serious constraint. So I do actually agree with Stefan on this, that I wish it were possible to have a more unified and coherent and therefore stronger foreign policy, uh, even if it meant more diversity in other areas, because I think that you know, I really wish that there was a third power that is not the United States and is not China. And I really wish it would be Europe. I really wish it would be Europe because I think Europe has something to offer, right? That's not the United States and, and it's not China. But, you know, if, if the 27 can't even agree on a coherent position towards Russia, which is a much more immediate threat, if they really can't, you know, so yes, um, I, I, I think that is um, dispiriting, right, to say the least. Uh, I wish it would be possible to have a more coherent foreign policy. Yeah, my view is that there is too much diversity in the European Union to achieve more unity. Diversity not only in terms of values, like Chris mentioned before, and principles, not, in, not only in, in histories and languages, but diversity in foreign policy, diversity in uh, defense matters, diversity even in issues of migration that supports to be integrated you see now with the refugee crisis, every country acted according to its own interest. They were not, uh, they, they couldn't agree to share the burden of, uh, of the refugees, of the number of the refugees, it's still happening now. So yeah, it, it would be nice to have a stronger uh, Europe, but it will be very difficult to integrate uh, farther. I believe that Europe should play on the cards that it is strong now, trade and environment. And this card is a leading power and it should play on these uh, cards, on these powers. That's my take. Um... Okay, uh, thank, thanks everybody for, uh, for participating in this, in this wonderful seminar. And it's, it's, it's not the only one. The next one we will be having definitely in our Hong Kong BU series, HKUB, will be on the French presidential elections. We're going to have a session on the French presidential elections in April. It's going to be organized by, well, I guess me and Emily. And, um, and we're going to have lots and lots of nice, interesting things to say. Uh, what, you know, how, um, uh, what's he called, Zemmour, you know, how, how did he go down to under 5% and, and all of these things. That's my prediction, but anyway, there you go. Um, so we'll have a, I'd be careful what I say in public, but you know, it's a uh, uh, fait shit, as uh, Jacques Chirac used to say, um, after his uh, rather strange uh, announcement of his candidacy. We're, we're talking about the French presidential elections here. Anyway, so that, that, that's for another day. Um, there are many, many things we can speak about uh, in the meantime, but thanks very much, Stefan. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Dionysos. Good night. <laughs>